my jazz piano teacher was an older guy. And so every now and then he would bring in something for me to try and learn. I remember he brought in, uh, he brought in Allentown by Billy Joel. And that mm -hmm. was like, that sort of felt like the closest we could get to some kind of middle ground. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this podcast is about you. Uh, we'll talk about your record and uh, your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. I know you that have sounds a, great. Quite a bit. No, quite a bit about podcasting. So I'm kind of yeah. But anyway, I and thank you for being here. My pleasure. Cool. Um, uh, do you need me to do anything on my side in terms of recording or anything like that? No, you're good, man. You're all okay, good. good. Yeah, we just we we got it on this end. So thank you. Okay, cool. Sweet. Uh, first off, talk to me about where were you born and raised. Uh, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, um, and I grew up in a suburb of Boston, Peabody, Massachusetts. Okay. What was it like growing up there? Um, I think it was pretty normal kind of suburban, uh, a suburban kind of existence. You know, I, I went to, uh, I went to elementary school across the street from where I, from where I lived, um, mm -hmm. it was literally across the street from my house and, That's um, cool. and, uh, yeah, it was a small school. Then I went, you know, went to a bigger middle school. Um, and all that time there was, was fine. I mean, I think it was, uh, boring, but looking back, it was probably boring in nice, stable ways. Sure. <laughs> and how did you get into music? Do you come from a musical household at all? No, I, I, my family is not really musical. Um, my, my dad has absolutely no sort of, um, uh, vocabulary or aptitude for music and my mom uh was a great singer sort of naturally but she had no formal training and she didn't really she didn't really know about music she just had, had a really nice voice she just had a good voice yeah um but they suggested that maybe i might want to take piano lessons we, we my mom used to work at sears in the mall mm -hmm. and um and we would go to drop her off or pick her up and next to sears was this uh was a, a like a little store local piano store called Scotty's Piano and Organ. And, uh, and sometimes when we would go, by, go by there to pick up my mom, I'd stop in and, you know, and like play around on the keys a little bit, not mm -hmm. knowing what I was doing, but then they suggested, um, that I maybe take piano lessons and they, they asked if I would be interested. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And because, because we had seen a sign at, uh, the store, they had a little sign that said private, you know, private piano lessons in the back. They had okay. a sort of showroom in the front and then they had a little office in the back and they had a piano and, and, um, and that's how I started playing music. Wow. How old are you when you would go tinker around on that piano? I think this was when I was around seven. Okay. So seven, you, you had an interest and then your parents put you in lessons at seven years old. And then did you carry on with the lessons or was piano something you kind of gave up at a certain point? No, I kept taking piano lessons until I got uh, into high school. Um, wow. I, I was uh, in high school and I, I took piano lessons until I basically, through my piano teacher, got a key to the drum room at, at school. And, um, and then I kind of got distracted by the drums and I stopped, I stopped taking piano lessons uh, when I was a sophomore and just was, I just wanted to play drums in bands. Okay. Did you play piano in a band at all or prior to that? Or did you play you know, in a school band? Yeah, I played ja I played piano in the in the school jazz band. Oh, cool. Um, and then later I I played drums in the in the jazz band as well. But really I wanted to be playing I wanted to be playing modern music. Okay. What were you like influenced by that you wanted to play on drums? Well, I remember when I first got to into that drum room um and I was trying to play, I would bring uh on a Walkman, I would bring a cassette copy. I had a, a tape that had a dub of um, 13 songs by Fugazi on it. Oh, and, amazing. And so, <laughs> That's quite an intro to drums. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I would just try and play along as best as I could to, uh, to the songs on that tape. What an amazing record to start with. <laughs> yeah. So, so Brendan, <laughs> Brendan Canty from Fugazi was my first drum teacher. That's amazing. <laughs> Especially going from jazz drums to, to Fugazi. Yeah, well, I or, had to first learn how to play drums at all from Fugazi before eventually making uh, the switch from okay. being the piano player in the jazz band to also sometimes I would play drums. Okay, I got you. <laughs> I got you. Um, were you learning, like, in, as far as, like, piano lessons go, it sounds like you, your taste was a bit, um, you know, not <laughs> classical piano, at least. Uh, were, were you learning any pop songs at all on, on piano, or was it something that was more classically trained? 
uh, I started, you know, my, my jazz piano teacher was an older guy. And so every now and then he would bring in something for me to try and learn. I remember he brought in, uh, he brought in Allentown by Billy Joel. And that mm -hmm. was like, that sort of felt like the closest we could get to some kind of middle ground. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like, well, we'll give you Billy Joel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anything yeah. else? No dice. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know, this song came out before I was born. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but it was still like for him, that was modern music. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's like, I got this hip new artist for you. His name is Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so from from that, from joining the jazz band, eventually playing drums in the jazz band, were you also in any out, out uh, bands outside of of the school? Yeah, like you starting mean, with your friends. Yeah, in in school, uh, most of the kids who played in bands, most of the kids who played in bands played in cover bands. You know, mm -hmm. it was just sort of you you kind of defined your band by what covers you did. There wasn't a lot of original songwriting that that happened for the most part. Mm -hmm. And um but I was in a but I got asked to be in a in a band with some friends and we played we were the only band. You know, it was kind of a it was a high school where there was a lot of um, you know, Almond Brothers, Steve Miller, Grateful Dead. Interesting. You know, kind of uh granola uh kind of stuff and we were the only only people probably in the whole school who listened to stuff like fugazi and minor threat and uh um and so we would we would play our punk songs and we were probably the only ones who cared about it that's interesting i wouldn't have guessed though like almond brothers type bands that steve miller like that coming from I me mean, because we're not that you're not that much older than me just a few years older than me and i don't remember yeah. kids in my elementary or high school at least that were into that it was more of like either punk or whatever 90s hip-hop that was happening at the time yeah uh, exactly. that's just interesting <laughs> yeah it was pretty weird i mean so i went so for high school i went to a private boarding school and it was okay. culturally it was culturally pretty different from from where i grew up i mean where i grew up it was like like i said in the suburbs of massachusetts it was basically like people listened to whatever was on the radio before i you know before i left for high school the stuff that I was drawn to the most was stuff like Public Enemy and uh, Ice T and um, and NWA, and then um, and also I was also getting into like Metallica and Megadeth. Mm -hmm. um, sort of those were the two two sides of the things that I was into. And then I got into high school and I discovered punk. Um, but at that school, it was just yeah, it was just a lot of. Um, I mean, it was a it was actually a pretty diverse school. Uh, in fact, it was much more diverse than where I'd come from, where I was, you know, the only, oftentimes the only non-white person in a class. Um, mm -hmm. Compared to that, uh, at my high school, kids were were, you know, coming in from not just around the country but around the whole world, and kids were on financial aid, and pe like half the school was on financial aid. So there was a very diverse mix of cultures and backgrounds. Um, um, cause I was a little worried going there being like, am I going to be the only kid on financial aid? Is it, you know, how's it going to be Sure, feel really weird, but actually there was such a, such diversity that it wasn't like that. But even despite the kind of, um, combination, the melting pot of all these different kinds of people coming together, I would still say there was a dominant cultural paradigm of like Northeast New England prep school vibes, because even if those that the kids who belong to that kind of demographic weren't the majority they still were like the plurality uh, mm -hmm. of the school and so so you know i might have my perspective and the kid next door to me might who you know grew up in taiwan uh and also listened to nwa like he might have his perspective but it didn't really compete with the you know 35 percent or 40 percent of the kids who all were like into fish and grateful dead Right, right. Now that's really interesting. Yeah. With with this high school, was it something that you uh, a place you wanted to go, or like in? It sounds like a pretty. I I I looked it up online earlier before we spoke, and it's like <laughs> you know you probably have to like you know audition or not audition, but is there like a process to get into the school? Yeah, like, did you have to have a certain GPA or like in? Yeah, it's almost like applying to college. You know, you right. had to, um, I had to take uh, the SSATs, which is like the SATs for high school, and you have to t and you have to you know have recommendations and all the stuff that you basically do for for college. You have to do that for for high school. So it was a combination of like yeah, your GPA and your standardized testing and all that stuff. And I I did want to go there because um, for one thing, I was kind of 
tired of feeling like I was a, considered a nerd in in school. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I kind of felt like I had a pretty narrow identity in in the in the school where I had been going in my middle school and in my the essentially my community. I felt like I was kind of seen kind of narrowly, and I just I just. I don't even know if I could articulate all of that, but I got excited about the idea of going to a school where other kids were uh, were excited about that stuff and where I wouldn't feel like I was um, an outcast or a pride or just like seen as a nerd where it would just be like, there are other mm-hmm. kids like me at the school too. Right, right. And obviously you're very smart. You ended up going to Yale and you must have been, you know, to 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 score to get into the school in general You it was were academics really important to you then um they were very important to my family um, okay you know the part of the reason why my family was even in america was because my dad had come to america to um get his graduate degree um and and i think they felt like coming to america was a place to get a great education okay and um and so they wanted a great education for their kids so um you know, that was part of the reason too why, why they were pushing, why they were excited about the idea of me going to private school, even if, even though financially it would have been difficult mm-hmm. um, because they were like, look, we got to make the most of whatever opportunity is possible. And so that in combination with, you, you know, uh, where I went, Phillips Exeter, they had really great financial aid um, packages available for, for people who qualified and who, who got it. And so luckily I was able to go and my parents made whatever sacrifices they needed you know, for them, it was like, that was the thing, which was, um, which was cool, but also made it very hard to go from, Hey, I'm on this path of like academics to me telling them, Hey, I want to be a songwriter and a musician and make music for the rest of my life. Right. Um, that was going to be my next question. Cause you go to Yale and you major in art. Was yeah. that a kind of a shock for them? <laughs> like, yeah. wait a second. <laughs> You're going yeah, to for like sure. the, you know, pinnacle of colleges and you want to major in art? <laughs> even actually, even uh, just going to Yale was a little bit of a surprise for them. I think they would have, you know, when, when as Indian immigrants, they basically only knew two colleges in America um, uh, before they'd come here, which was Harvard and MIT. And, Interesting. Uh, and so they were like, well, these are the places that you want you know, these are the places that you should try to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, even before that, I think there were kind of, there were three paths that they had envisioned for me, um, which is I could be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And when I told them that I wanted to go to Yale um, or that I had, I actually applied without telling them. And I, I applied there because my favorite English teacher had gone there and I thought I wanted to be like him and follow mm-hmm. in his footsteps. And I had the sense that like Yale was a, was an artsy school um, more so than, than Harvard was or something like that. And I was just like, well, if I'm going to, you know, take a shot at trying to get, get into one of the best schools, I want to go to the one that feels like, I don't know, that, that the door might be open to these kind of um, artistic inclinations that I felt like I had, even if I hadn't fully, developed them yet mm-hmm. so i kind of uh did it without telling them and until i got in and then i you know i applied early and i, I got in and i was like hey so this is where i'm going to college so at that point it was out of their hands I was, just like, this is- <laughs> was that something they were upset about or was it just like oh okay no it wasn't it wasn't exactly that they were upset it's just they were like they're like well that's cool but like how come you didn't apply to one of these other places instead one of these places that we've known about and you know and if you'd gone to MIT then you could become an engineer or you could become a doctor if you went to Harvard you could become a doctor or a lawyer you know these things and I was like well I mean I think they recognize that you could still be a doctor or a lawyer go to Yale obviously right but, um, but it just wasn't it wasn't a school it just wasn't a part of the plan that they had uh, hoped for or something like that mm-hmm it's not to say it was a disappointment. It's just not. Right, like right. A, it's just what? funny to be like, and then I didn't tell them that I was applying to Yale. Yeah. <laughs> like, any other pair would be like, like yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> but so first they had to get over that. And then when I got there and then I was like, and so I'm going to be an art major. And that really <laughs> kind of made them hit the brakes. And they were like, how is that? How do you make a living? You know, like, how do you, uh, the, the, I think for them, they had made all these sacrifices to try and, uh, give me the best education possible, but also, you know, with the ultimate goal of not just the education itself, but having like a secure 
life and uh, mm-hmm. feeling like I could have a good life. And, and for them, that really was like, oh, yeah, that's what doctors have. And we know a lot of people who are doctors. My parents mm-hmm. aren't doctors, but they knew, you know, my aunt and uncles in India were doctors. And that was just that was the that was the path. And then otherwise an engineer and otherwise a lawyer. So, um yeah, it really didn't compute for them. And then, then they started to get really worried. Like, I think a path that felt pretty good, they were like, okay, good. You're doing well in school. Okay. You're going to good schools. That was all good. It was, it felt like it, things were fine. And then, um, and then I was like, I'm an art major. Also I'm playing in bands and this is what I want to spend most of my time doing. Um, they started to, uh, you know, started to feel some level of panic, I think. Real quick before I move, I'm going to edit this part out. Your camera w- is pulling focus from you into, oh, yeah. into the background. I just want to make sure that it. it yeah, it, I think I, I just need to you... make sure I keep my face in one place. Oh, I didn't know if you could like lock it on you or something. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. I just didn't want you to be like, and then you watch it and you're like, what is going on? Okay, I just wanted to <laughs> double check. Cool. And we'll pick up now. Um, okay, so going to, to Yale, you're, you're, Get a, you're deciding on an art degree. What does that look like as far as a degree in art? Were you going from, is it music based or just like, what were you studying? I studied um, graphic design and photography. And the way I got into the idea of being an art major at all was because of seeing a class listing for graphic design and reading what that was. I realized um, it was just a name for something that I was already doing. I just didn't know the name of it because I had spent Uh, so much of high school making posters for my bands and Mm. i loved um you know i loved packaging and and, uh album design for for my favorite bands so it was because of music that i started doing that kind of stuff um i just didn't know it was called graphic design i thought well here's a way for me to have to like deepen this way that i engage with music um in some totally different area and it was just something that i was excited by I, I liked the idea of like making book covers and album covers and websites all, all that seemed like uh that would be in my future if i study this and then i took a photography class and then i just fell in love with photography okay real quick to rewind here for half a second the the bands that you're in in high school were you writing the songs for these bands i mean you talked about being kind of like in in punk punk bands and that was the thing that you we're, we're into different than the Almond Brothers and all the other things that the other kids are doing. Um, with this co- with this group of friends that you start this band with, is it something that you're, is just kind of a fun thing you're doing? Were you taking it a bit seriously? Were you playing shows around the Boston area? And so in high school, like the kids would just play, you know, parties at school. And, Got it. And, like, and they would just play covers. The first time I ever wrote a song was actually um, the end of my time in high school, I started to learn how to play guitar with the idea of trying to learn another instrument and maybe try and write music. And so I wrote a song in high school and I performed it, you know, my senior year um, uh, at a at a concert. And that was my first time um, after kind of outside of the, the these band uh, experiences. That was my first time with any kind of original music. Um, and then when I got to college, that was I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to write songs and and so I started playing in band, uh, in a band in college um, with two other guys, and uh, we all wrote songs, and, and I played guitar and drums. I ma- mainly played drums, um, but on a couple of songs, we would switch, and I'd play guitar. Oh, okay. With the song that you played in high school, what was that like, that moment, like having, okay, and I wrote this song. I'm going to play it in front of my whole peer group of, of people, and not only that, I've this is the first song I've written was talk about it like a vulnerable moment. Like, what was that like? Yeah, it was, that was pretty terrifying. Um, but, uh, but exciting too. Mm -hmm. I think it's funny. Like when it comes to those situations where you'll speak with an artist and and you'll hear that their first performance ever was like in front of the school. And to me that like, that seems so much more terrifying than just like playing a coffee shop to, some people that you might not ever run into ever again, but yet you're (laughs) playing to like a group of people that you're going to have to see tomorrow or Monday morning. (laughs) Like they could be and kids are brutal. They could be critical. Like that wasn't even something that entered your mind. It was just, I want to get up here and do this. Uh, I think they, I I think both. I was um, worried about people being critical, but I also felt like I I wanted to do it. Also, I was a senior, it was like towards the end of my senior year. And, uh, you know, (laughs) I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to stick around there that much. (laughs) Right. Okay. 
and it wasn't in front of the entire school luckily you know it was um it was a small performance in it in the church the school church and okay it was like in the evening and people knew that i was playing so a bunch of my friends came specifically to hear me play that night that's awesome that's supportive of them that's cool yeah yeah so at yale's when you start the, the real first real band that you're in writing songs yeah okay. yeah and yeah and uh and we we played shows and we put out we actually made a record um, really yeah we put out a cd um a couple of friends of mine started a record label and they they put out our cd um so that started to feel real um and then towards the towards the end of that i i started um playing shows just on my own playing shows again just guitar and and voice and then and then later i added a drum machine but i started playing solo shows and that was when i i felt like i don't want to just play in front of kids i go to school with like i want to play in front of strangers not because of the safety of it but but really the opposite i felt like it's not real if it's just your friends coming to see you play mm -hmm. you know you, you need to kind of test this in front of people who have no vested interest in you and if they respond to it then that starts to feel more like i'm doing something real and not just some kind of self-indulgent hobby sure was that uh 1 a.m radio was that that was that you or yourself or was that yeah. that was okay yeah and so you yeah. start that and uh, you're still in college at this point and was that the the path was now you know shifted to i want to be a graphic designer i'm going to go to college for art but i really like the songwriting thing how do you kind of try to make that your your career path at that point i wasn't thinking about it as a career path yet okay because i honestly didn't even know what that meant i didn't know what it meant to be a musician professionally mm -hmm. or how one could even have a career so i was thinking well i got into graphic design um because of music but it has this possibility for a i could make a living doing that and that would be my sort of uh my my version of a creative but stable career and in the and then around that i would just try and play music as much as i could um i started to meet people who were in bands who were going on tour and that seemed really exciting but i didn't know anybody who whose job was it was to be a musician so it was pretty hard to to envision so by the time i finished college i was just like i just knew that it was what i loved but um i didn't know how to i, I had no aspirations of it being my job because it just didn't seem like anything i could imagine mm -hmm. and what do, what do you do to do you graduate and just try to get a job as a graphic graphic designer for a big company or like what is the step after that like yeah you finish? i yeah i applied to a few different places like a couple of graphic design firms in boston and um and i i didn't know you know i had this feeling of like i wanted to move to los angeles mm -hmm. um because one one thing that i could imagine um as a career because i knew that there were people who did this over and over again was um making music for films i was like that seems like okay. something where there's some it, it seemed exciting again i didn't know anybody who did it but i was like maybe that's something that i could do that feels like i could do that i could work towards that while also trying to make more records and play more shows but it was just too hard um again the possibility of moving across the country where I didn't know anybody to do a job that I didn't have. You know, I was like, how, will, where will I live and how will I pay my rent? I just had no idea. So um, out of fear to some extent of, of the unknown, I ended up just staying in Massachusetts and moving in with my parents and getting a job working for like an internet startup doing, doing graphic design. Okay. And from, from that gig, like, you know, kind of tell me is your career, if you were rolling through your resume, like, so that you have that job and then are you, is music still just kind of the thing that you're doing as a hobby and how does it then kind of progress? What, what changed was I went on a tour. Um, I went on a tour during that time, you know, so this was like when I was 21 years old, mm -hmm. um, I went on a tour and it felt really, uh, exciting. Like it was a longer tour and I actually came back from it with money in my pocket like i made wow. enough money that i could buy uh, i remember i bought an eight track digital recorder with the money that i made from it so that i could start working on a full length um, i'd put out a couple of things i'd put out like a couple of seven inch singles and i'd put out mm -hmm. a cd like an ep but um but i was like i'm working towards a full length and i wanted to 
record it myself. So I got this eight track with my, the money that I'd made. And that started to feel like, hey, this is something that, you know, I could imagine a version of this where everything got bigger and I could really do this. And so in my heart, I made this decision where I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing music on the side. Music is going to be what I'm aiming at. And, and I will ha have this job, <laughs> the exact same job that I had yesterday. But tomorrow I'm thinking of this as just, uh, it's just a means to an end of getting to be a musician full time. I will keep working at this uh, as for as long as I need to until music is my entire life. Oh, okay. So that was just like, now you, now it's switched. Music yeah. is the, we're going to try to make this happen. And this graphic design job is paying the bills and feeding me until we can make that happen essentially. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And e even though my day, my day-to-day -day life looked exactly the same, my internally, I felt differently about it. Mm -hmm. With that tour, was it something that you did on your own or did you book it? Did you go with someone? I opened for my friend's band, uh, this um, like hardcore band that I was friends with from Connecticut called Jerome's Dream. And they had a had a following, um, you know, kind of all over the world in like a in a in a community of like heavy punk rock kind of screamo um, mm -hmm. music fans. And my music as the 1AM radio sounded nothing like that. I mean, it was very quiet and uh, and it was just me, like I said, just me and an uh, electric guitar and sometimes a drum machine. Um, but they were fans of, of my music and I was fans of their uh, music and um, they said, would you like to come with us? And uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. So they, they, they booked it and I got to tag along and um, it was great. Wow. Were you nervous at all going on stage before to a, a crowd waiting for like a heavier band and not being in that same genre? Yeah. It was always a little bit of a challenge to see whether or not people were even open-minded to the idea of music that was so different. Um, and not all of them were, but I found that um, it was actually a much more receptive audience than you might imagine. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, like it was like, you know, there's still emo and screamo. <laughs> and so, right, right. <laughs> you know, so, so there was definitely some appetite for, uh, you know, contemplative, introspective, quiet music. Mm -hmm. I think the, the industry now is so so it's just different than you know at least when i was growing up if you like punk rock like you liked punk rock like you weren't gonna tell your friend that you were into the whatever britney spears record if you liked one of her songs yeah. it was just like i only listen to rancid and off ivy and like you know <laughs> whoever else is on yeah. fat records at the time or whatever it may be um and now it's more with playlisting and just even if you look at like a festival lineup it's like the 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 lineups are just so diverse and it's yeah. so different nowadays. And I think if you saw two bands that weren't similar on the same bill now, it wouldn't be as big of a deal, but in the sense back then it could have been like a totally different, you know, response from the crowd. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it was, so... it was, you know, and there, there were some times where there'd be kids who were there to mosh and they're like, what the hell is this? Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Um, okay. So that's going, you get home, you get the A track and are you working on what became the next record at that point? And was it all done by you? Yeah. Um, so the, the full length that came out, my first full length as the 1am radio was something that, yeah, I wrote and recorded. Um, I, uh, eventually I moved to Brooklyn for a little while, um, but okay. between living in Massachusetts and living in Brooklyn, that's where I, where I record, you know, whatever bedroom I was in. Um, is where I made the record. Mm -hmm. and, and at what point does the, do you get to lose the graphic design job? Uh, I, I had my first year as um, a musician who made his living entirely for music in 2007. So mm -hmm. it was a few, it took a few years um, before I, before I was busy enough with music um, and successful enough with it that I didn't have to worry about doing freelance design jobs. Um, but that only went, that only lasted for about a year and a half um, before I got asked by the record label that I was, I was signed to a record label at that point. And they asked me if I would come help run their art department. Um, since it was something they, they were like, you know, us, you know, our, you know, the label, you know, the other bands, you know, kind of what the aesthetic is. 
and we sorry all good all good um you know the other bands and you know what our aesthetic is and so will you come and and uh help us with album packaging and websites and stuff like that wow and um at that point my record my first record for the label had come out and i had toured and i uh felt like okay this is uh oh my gosh i'm so sorry no it's all good that's the beauty of these things, man. I I, I know you do a po- I know you do very very successful podcasts, <laughs> and uh, I there's something fun about the just the the you know humanness of some of these things where it's just like and there's a dog barking. Oh well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else listening to this probably has a dog that barks. You know, every once in a while. So I just yeah. leave it if that's cool with you. I don't really. Oh, care. okay, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I just think there's something cool and raw about it. I just yeah. For me, it's it, I like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so don't apologize. <laughs> um. So anyway, I I started uh I started working at the record label, um doing doing graphic design stuff while also trying to work on the next record that I was going to do. And were you on, is this when you're on danger bird? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love so I that label. LA. And so you must, yeah, that was my next question. So you had moved to LA at this time, at this point to work for the label. And at, I mean, you said, what year was that? You said 2000. What so year my, did first, that... my first record on danger bird came out in 2007. I moved to okay. LA in, in 2006 permanently. I, I had, I had come to LA for a few years from 2002 to 2004. And then between touring and stuff like that, I was kind of all over the place for a little while. And mm-hmm. then in 2006, I came back to LA and kind of settled down here. And that's when I started. Um, that's when I met the folks from danger bird. And then my, my, first record with them came out in 2007 and then after i finished touring and everything on that record um i produced a a record for for a a band on danger bird and then this art department thing happened it was 2008 so i was kind of um i was kind of getting to engage in a bunch of different parts of my my creative brain right world of music by making my own record by producing another band's record and by um, you know, being the art director for, for the label. And what a cool label too, to be working with. I mean, yeah. I've always loved the bands that Danger Bird has signed. And I mean, Silver Sun Pickups are a big one yep. from them. And uh, just, it, it's just such a cool label. And it was a cool independent label that kind of became almost big enough to really, you know, get their songs out and get their artists in front of enough people. Yeah, Whereas some exactly. labels are like, you know, if you sign to a, a, an indie, you might not get the exposure that maybe Danger Bird could offer. Yeah, they were definitely swinging for the fences. Sure. Well, it was a cool like producing on a record. Like, I, I don't know the artist, but an artist signed to Danger Bird that you got a chance to like produce their record. Was that pretty cool? Like, did you like that role? Yeah, I loved that. I did. I did two records for this band, Eulogies. Um, that okay. was a band of Peter Walker, who's one of the co-owners of Danger Bird. Wow. Um, and, uh, and I co-produced it with him. And so it was, it was really great. It was great to be able to take the things that I had thought about with music, um, and had, you know, applied to my own songwriting and suddenly have a completely different context, um, to do it. And also as opposed to the way that I'd made music, which like I said, was in my bedroom, we got to do these in like real studios with real engineers and real gear and uh and so it was for me it was like being a kid in a toy store Mm -hmm. and to work on i mean obviously he peter walker uh, appreciated you as a songwriter and knew that like respected you and what you were doing and bringing to the table or he wouldn't have asked you the from the head guy at the label to be like hey do you want to work on my my band's project at all yeah that must have been pretty validating yeah, yeah, it was. And especially to do one, not just one record, but then to be asked back and do the next album as well. Yeah, that's so cool. And how long were you uh, working with Danger Bird? Um, so I put out I put out one record in 2007, and then the next record I put out in 2011, which was the last record I put out as the 1AM Radio. Okay, wow. And then from, from 1AM Radio, where, what was the next uh, step in your career? Well, then I kind of uh, hit... A big wall um, after that record came out, um, and I and I haven't put out another record um, until 
I this new one? It. Yeah, this new one comes out tomorrow. Um, yeah, wow. So it's been 11 years uh, since then. And in between, you know, I did, um, I, I did a lot of other things in the music world. You know, I, I scored um, a couple of films and a TV show and, and a video game. Um, but those were all kind of, you know, job, those were jobs, essentially. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I also started the Song Exploder podcast. And then from that, I started doing other podcasts as well, either mm -hmm. um, shows that I was producing and hosting myself or shows that I was, you know, um, executive producing and creating for other people. That's so cool. I mean, when did you get in the, I mean, how did you end up getting into podcasting? I'm just curious because it's your career is so fascinating to me and the, the, what you've accomplished as, you know, a podcaster that then it turns into a show on Netflix and just the level of talent that you're able to to get on your show. I mean... I love, I mean, listening to Halsey's episode that you did talking about, um, I think what she talked about, Honey, what song did she talk about? No, uh, it's off the new record, but I can't think of the name off the top of my head. Um, but like, just like those, I thought that was so, like, I love what you're doing. I think it's so amazing. And so do millions upon millions of other people, but just uh, how, like podcasting when you started, wasn't what it is now. Right. So yeah. was it some, like, how did you land in this world? Yeah. Um, the Halsey episode was about, uh, you asked for this. Oh, you asked for this. That's what it was. And she talks about, uh, who did she write it with? Um, Greg Kirsten. Yes. And she talks about being at his house with his kids and stuff. Yeah. Um, and just writing the lyric and that the lyrics to that song are, <laughs> are, are amazing, but it's just interesting to hear what the, the scenario in which she wrote those lyrics, I think is pretty, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Song Exploder started because I was in this period where I kind of felt stuck with my own um, music. I didn't know what I was going to write about. I, I knew I had to kind of start over um, from the, you know, and, and, and write more songs. And mm -hmm. I just felt daunted by that idea The you know, between between my first my first album and my second album coming out there was two, a two year gap first mm -hmm. record came out in 2002 second came out in 2004 and then between the second and the third there was a three year gap and then between the third and the fourth there was a four year gap and i was okay. like oh my god and we keep on going like this <laughs> they're it's getting like, bigger and bigger yeah <laughs> okay it's, just, it's taking me it's it's harder and harder for me to write and i don't know why and i was daunted about the idea that like, okay, now I have to go back. Um, now this record's done. Am I going to spend five years trying to write the next record? Um, and what, what if it doesn't work and what's going to happen? And um, I kind of painted myself into a corner a little bit psychologically where I just, I just felt paralyzed. So um, I was, you know, working on these film scores and, and that kind of gave me a little bit of a reprieve because I was like, well, I'm working on music and I'm working towards this other goal that I'd had, this other dream that I'd had years ago. Um, so it's okay that I'm not making songs, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but then those projects ended and I still didn't have any songs. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? Um, and one thought that I had had for a little while was, was this idea of a, of a podcast where there was a sort of a kind of show and tell for artists where they could say, I was thinking about this and I made this and you'd hear just the isolated stem of whatever mm -hmm. part of the song they were talking about. And then they could go on and tell you another part and you could hear just that. And they could talk about all the weird things that they'd done to get that sound. You know, I remember reading an uh, article in Tape Op magazine, uh, which I loved and had a subscription to. Um, I remember first reading it. I was on tour in Florida and some, I was reading an issue in, in the house where we were staying, the punk house we were staying in. Um, the books were talking about how they had made a kick drum sound by putting a microphone inside a filing cabinet and putting um, a, a, a speaker against the bottom of the filing cabinet and like running it through there. It was something wild <laughs> to try and get this like deep frequency. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I hadn't heard the song um, that they were talking about or, or, or maybe I had, but I couldn't identify how those things connected. I was like, this sounds so cool. What did it sound like? And I just wanted to hear what it sounded like. Mm -hmm. and that was in like 2004. And so I remember, you know, around this time, I started listening to podcasts at that time. Um, not a lot because there weren't that many. Right. But, but I was thinking, wow, something like this would be a way to have that kind of interview. 
and then you'd get to hear that part you know you get to hear it, it maybe the stem of just that kick drum made out of a <laughs> out of a filing cabinet or mm -hmm. something and wouldn't that be cool um i knew from being a bedroom producer myself like all kinds of strange things that i had done and used you know i remember like there was a song that where the the drum track was made up out of i'd heard this <laughs> truck driving down the street in the middle of the night and it was the craziest sound i was like what is happening i just heard the sound and i went out and i remember and i grabbed my a little dictaphone that i had and i ran out to the street and on the street there was a truck going by slowly in the middle of the night that was dragging bottles behind it like glass bottles and you could hear it up and down the street so i'd heard it from really far away and i recorded it and i was like that is a crazy sound and uh and then months later i was making a song and i used that as part of the rhythm track um and you know and i was like that's a story that at the time i was like i'll never get to tell that story mm -hmm. you know and no one will ever hear when I, when they listen to this song and they hear this kind of weird little jingly glass sound what that actually was and i was daydreaming about a show where someone could you know where someone mm -hmm. would say i did this and so um song exploder kind of came out of that that combination of like wanting to share those kinds of stories that I didn't get to and, and knowing that other artists would have those kinds of stories and being in a moment where I was like, well, I don't know. I don't know how or when I'll be able to write songs again, but I still mm -hmm. want to be, I still want to have my hands in all of this music stuff. Um, so that's how the podcast started. Wow. That's, uh, that's really cool. Uh, I, I came from radio and um, this one started in end or, we the idea formed in 2018 and then it started in 2019 which i felt like i was really late to the game but now like when COVID happened then every you know buddy in the planet started making a podcast <laughs> so i felt like i was a little bit ahead of some people uh but it was the same thing like i wanted to i didn't get to have the freedom that i wanted to on a terrestrial station and to hear i even pitched the idea to them and they were like no nah, we don't we don't want to deal with that I'm like, all right cool here's some paperwork sign this give it to me <laughs> uh but anyway like yeah it's just it's just hearing people's stories and, and, and because i never had a chance to i was always interested by bands and was never a songwriter but intrigued by people that could do it and loved playing guitar and but seeing bands like from my hometown succeed and being like whoa how did they do this like what was it what did they do differently yeah. Um, it's, it's always just such a fascinating, you know, other people's lives are, are so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So you start the podcast. I mean, obviously that takes a chunk of your life, right? It starts to happen. It starts taking off. And then once, once it does, it's, are you, you're kind of then now this is like your new identity. Yeah. It was a strange thing to, um, see who I was kind of shifting a little bit, you know, because of the way I started it, it was like, oh, hi, it's, I'm Rishi from the 1am radio, and I'm making a podcast. Will you be on it? You know, you know me from the 1am radio. Um, mm -hmm. uh, will you be on my show? And then, um, and then at a certain point, Song Exploder was better known than the music that I'd made, even though I'd, I'd spent, you know, a decade of my life on the 1am radio, um, this thing that was kind of a uh, side project um, ended up being um, more well known. And, uh, and, and then it was like, Oh, I'm the person who makes song exploder, until it got to a point where, you know, um, people who were on the show were like, Oh, I, I didn't realize you were a musician, too. Interesting. So you're like, Oh, yeah, this is shifting. Like it went from everyone knew me as 1am radio to now, now I'm song exploder guy that you're finding out now that I'm a musician. Yeah. That must have I mean, been an interesting turn. Yeah. I never thought everybody knows me as the one AM radio. I always like, well, not that many people know me, but if you do know me, it's Oh, you know me as one AM. But, but I mean, yeah. to have a 10 year career and uh, sign to a label like danger bird, produce records for people on danger bird. Yeah. And it says something. It's not like you were like, ah, oh, yeah, I played a couple shows in Boston at this, <laughs> <Right>. you know, <laughs> you know, restaurant or whatever it was. Yeah. So yeah, it was a thing. And then, yeah. yeah, that kind of just obviously took over. And now you're back, what, at least at 11 years since your last record. Yeah. And how long have you been working on the record? Or is this just been ideas or was it, was there a moment where you're like, I want to get back in this. I'm going to start writing a record. And when, when was that decision made? 
I started feeling about, you know, after about five years of making the podcast, I started to feel like, wow, um, this, I, I feel bad about, um, this part of my life that used to be who I was, um, you know, essentially ha having disappeared. So around 2017 or so, so it had been about six years since my last record came out. Um, I had had a side project that I did with Lakeith Stanfield called Moors, mm -hmm. where um, that was like a hip hop project that uh, was very cool. But, you know, and I made it was I was really making the instrumentals and producing the songs. Um, but it was different from what I knew, what I experienced as the one in radio, you know, where I was really like the sole songwriter and producer and stuff like that. And I missed that experience. Um, but despite missing it, I still didn't know how to get over my writer's block. Um, so there was a, there was an emotional part of it, but then there was also just like a pragmatic part of it where I had started song exploder and then through song exploder started other podcasts. I'd started this podcast called the Western weekly. That was like mm -hmm. a weekly show. And, um, and so for a while in my life, I was putting out seven episodes of a podcast every month. Um, you know, like, uh, and song exploder was a lot of editing and a lot of work. And, and then Western weekly was like a hour long, you know, researched weekly show with interviews and guests and things like that. So even if I wanted to make music, uh, or even if I somehow was able to reconnect with my ability to write songs again, I didn't know how to fit it into my life. Um, but that's really not the way I was thinking of it. The way I was thinking of it was, um, gosh, I wish I could write a song, but I don't even have the time to try. Um, cause of my, ob the obligations that I've set up for myself, um, I have to attend to those first, you know, I, and there's always some, it was always easier to check off something on the list that was like, finish this episode, finish the interview, email this publicist back or, um, you know, there were, there were a set of discrete objectives that had to be completed for any podcast episode that came out every two weeks or every week mm -hmm. that were a lot more manageable than the idea of, you know, if the line item was write a song, <laughs> that's something that after having spent four years trying to make a record, I was like, well, how many months is it going to take me to cross this thing off? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just put this off till tomorrow because I have these other five things that I can do today. And then, and then I do the next thing the next day. And then I do the next thing the next day. And then all of a sudden, you know, after me saying like, I want to get back into writing songs, a year had passed and I still hadn't, I hadn't even tried. Mm -hmm. um, so I was getting pretty bummed out about how all that was unfolding or rather it wasn't unfolding. Um, but I really wanted to get back to music. Um, this, the, the, this EP that's coming out is, uh, for the most part, songs, there's, there's six songs on it. Five of them I, I wrote, um, you know, between, between December of 2020 and uh, October of 2021. So they represent, you know, about a, a 10 or 11 months of my life. And then there's one song that came a little bit earlier. That was the first song that I was first song that I was able to write again, um, which was, but that wasn't until 2018. Wow. Okay. And then, so these, the, the rest of the record was essentially written December. And then when did you wrap it up? It sounds like it wasn't all that long. Yeah, I, wrap, I wrapped it up, you know, finished mixing it in December and then mastered it in January. Wow. Wow. So, and you put out two of the songs thus far from the record? Uh, three so far. Three, three. Okay. The yeah. most, the one I just, most recent one is Stillness. Is that the yeah. most recent one? Yeah. Which is an amazing song. It looks like you have features on all of them except for that song. Yeah. So um, there, the first two songs that came out both had features. The mm -hmm. first one had Yo-Yo Ma playing cello on it. And the second one ha was a duet with j mm -hmm. Um And then this, this song, uh, there's no feature on it. There's another song on the EP that doesn't have a feature, the first track on it. Oh yeah, sure. Okay. And then there are a couple more that, that also, that do have features. And were these like writing these songs, did the pandemic have any like effect on having more time to do this or like, well, you know, not... the funny thing is that, uh, I only, <laughs> I only really experienced songwriting again in the pandemic. So I didn't really have something to compare it to, to say, oh, look how different it is to write songs now in the right. pandemic versus before. For me, there was the, the before was. 10 years ago, 
Um, mm-hmm. My life was so different in so many ways that uh, that um, writing the songs this way was just how I wrote them. It's just like, well, these were the circumstances, uh, and it wasn't really um, any. There wasn't anything to compare it to either for the for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say, like, because due to the pandemic, was that would kind of give you the, an, an extra push for let's really, I have a little bit more time now to work on putting out a record? What I think really um, it took was just me making the concrete decision. Okay. Uh, af- after the Netflix show wrapped up, after we finished, you know, editing all the episodes that we had shot, um, that was, we were about, you know, six months into the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, when the first set of episodes came out, then we put out the second set of episodes. And by that time I was like, okay, this is a huge project. This was another uh, way that I was able to cross something off my list that had been sitting there for, you know, over, for over a year, year and a half. Um, I thought before I take on anything else on, I want to get back. I want to find a way to get back to writing songs. So at that point, the West Wing Weekly podcast had also wrapped up. Mm-hmm. So these things were wrapping up. And before there was ever a pandemic, I had thought at the beginning of 2020, I was like, you know, I'm going to finish these projects. I had this pro- podcast called Partners that was going to come out in 2020. I was like, I'm going to finish all of these things mm-hmm. and I'm not going to say yes to anything else. I'm not going to take anything else on until I can find a way to start making music again. Um, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and uh, and so I said, well, I've finished these projects and um, and so I'm going to make this time. The one thing that probably helped is that I... <laughs> I couldn't get distracted by say like socializing. Right. Um, <laughs> so I had already kind of made the commitment to being like, I'm going to make time for in my work life to make my music part of my work. But, um, but I know that, yeah, having, having no choice, but to sit in front of the computer, to be in the studio um, really helped me commit to the thing that I had decided to do. Mm-hmm. And now you get a chance to to play these songs. The record's done, and and you were at South by Southwest what last week or two weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. And what was it like? You know, was this the first time you've played, you know, to an audience as like a musician in how many years? Um, yeah, I mean, the last shows that I had done uh, as a musician at all was playing with Moors, you know, which was in tw- the last show we played was in 2015. But that was a show where you know I. I did a little bit of singing, but mostly I was um, essentially DJing beats that I had made, and Lakeith is, was the front man. Mm-hmm. In terms of playing a song and singing in front of people, you know, I hadn't played a full show like that in 10 years. Wow. Was that a difficult thing to kind of jump back into, or were you pretty prepared for it? No, I was terrified. Um, <laughs> um, I don't feel like I'm a natural performer to begin with uh i don't feel like i'm not the kind of musician who's like oh i live to be on the stage (laughs) i I much prefer being in the studio um than than i do playing in front of people but it's also part of the job and i and i do like parts of it but um but there's a lot of stage fright and terror that i have to get over to do it um the one thing that i've done live much more uh often in the years in between have, has been, you know, doing live podcasts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the West Wing Weekly did, uh, uh, you know, people who don't care about the West Wing um, and, or, and have never heard this podcast will be shocked to hear this. But like it was a we did huge shows, live shows, um, like the kinds of shows that I could never have even dreamed about as a musician, like in my wildest dreams of being a musician. Um, like the we played in London, we played. We played a live show in front of 3,200 people in London. Wow! Um, you know, it was uh, like at at, uh, at the uh, Apollo. You know, where 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 Queen and like David Bowie played. You know, mm-hmm. right? So I had been on stage in front of a lot of people, but not as a musician and not as a singer. Um, and so, getting back into that, um, the o- the only way that I've been able to figure out how to do that is by trying to bring a little bit of this other existence into it. So, um, so the tour that I just did with my friend, Jenny Owen Youngs, who who Mm -hmm. I wrote a lot of these songs with, um, was kind of a hybrid between, uh, what I'd been doing, you know, like these kinds of conversational things on stage, um, crossed with the way I used to play shows, you know, which was song, 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 song. 
So how would you mix them up? Would you have a conversation then with, with Jenny Owens Young's and then you yeah. guys would talk about what the process behind each song or like, what was, what was it like? Yeah. Yeah. It was sort of a mix of these three different versions of me that I've gotten to experience, you know, okay. uh, the first version being like the 1am radio where I would play these shows in an extremely earnest and serious and quiet way. And then the second is song exploder talking about the, the feelings uh, and ideas that go into why a song uh, gets created. And then the third was the, you know, the kind of conversational podcasts that I'd made, um, Westman Weekly and this other show, Home Cooking, that I created during the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, both of those were, you know, sort of shows with my friends um, where we would talk about something informationally, but there was a kind of a intimate chat quality to it as well. Um, so Jenny, who also has a podcast, um, and I kind of tried to thread these three things together. So we would talk, talk to each other about, um, about our friendship and about um, our relationship as songwriters. Um, so much of the origin story that I had for these songs involved Jenny. So talking about them in a kind of song exploder way in any kind of uh, way um, necessarily meant talking about about Jenny and she was right there on stage with me. So, so we'd kind of get to talk about them together. Um, but we would do it in this kind of fun conversational way because we genuinely are very close friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was really not, and then we would punk and then we would play the songs. So it was, uh, kind of half storytelling, half song performance. Wow. And were this, or were you able to work directly with her when you were writing the songs, or was this something that you did kind of virtually? We, she, she, uh, and I first met when she lived in L.A. And the first song that we wrote together um, was here in L.A. We wrote it in person. The, um, the song that was in 2018. Okay. Um, but then she moved away. She moved to Maine in the pandemic, and so um, the other songs that I wrote with her, we did over Zoom. Wow. So it, did, it was like a hybrid. Then. What was the first song that you wrote, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it was Memory Palace. Okay, so it was Memory of oh, the one that she's featured on. And she's that makes sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that from that song, then when you start, when the pandemic hits, and you're, was it, like, how did you feel about sharing the files back and forth? Was that something that was, I mean, it must have been quite different than writing the original one with her. Um, you know, it actually didn't feel that different because Jenny's an incredibly warm and personable uh, figure, and she has done a lot of writing and co-writing. So mm -hmm. she is a really wonderful um, kind of guide or something like that. You know, she she just kind of sets the tone in a way that's really wonderful. And we're also genuinely great friends. So mm -hmm. it just felt like hanging out. And, um, and so when we would write, um, we would... Um, we wrote not that differently. You know, when she came over, we we had pads of paper <laughs> where we were keeping notes and writing things. When we were on um, Zoom, we just did it on a Google Doc. So okay. it wasn't that different. You know, it was a combination of we both, but but a lot of things were the same. We both had guitars. We both were talking to each other and recording voice memos as things uh, felt like they were coming together and then um, trying to co kind of cobble those ideas together. Amazing. And the tour picks up again May, May. 8th. Yeah, yeah. We we did the East Coast uh, and South by Southwest um, for now, and then we'll do the West Coast in May. Very, very cool. L.A., San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. It looks like. Yeah. Um, I love the Independent where you're playing in San Francisco. That's a great venue. Yeah. So very cool. Um, and thank you so much for for doing this. Um, Thanks for having you're, me. Yeah, you're somebody I really look up to in the, oh, in wow. this world, and um. I mean, your songs are amazing. Uh, the fact that you score, you know, not only films, but some of the podcasts, the music for the podcast, I think is so oh, really cool. I mean, so cool. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. Wow. And to hear that you were editing like your I mean, episodes, I mean, just all of that, like that is, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I, I, you're somebody I really look up to in this industry. And I really appreciate like what you've done for podcasting and just, you know, being so early to the game. It's just, it's really, really cool. Wow, thank you so much. You really made my day. That That's incredibly uh, nice of you to say, and it, oh. it, it means a lot. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's the truth. I do have one more question for you. And I guess uh, this could go for songwriters or now, I guess, podcasters, because I'm going to 
note this advice down myself, but I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Well, I think the advice that I had to learn um, myself was to take the work of making art seriously um, and treat it like work. You know, I think part of the reason why it took me four years to write uh, to write an album or three years before that was because I kind of expected myself as a creative person to just be creative and that the you know the creative winds would blow my way and something would come out and and that's how art got made um one of the things i've learned from making song exploder and getting to talk to so many different artists is how much of what they do is a practice and li literally a practice you have to make time and and so the best thing that i have done for myself is setting aside this time to um to make music or to try to make music you know you might not it might not always work but um but by saying okay on this day i'm gonna write a song and you know putting in in my calendar it, it feels silly in some ways to try and schedule creativity but you have to just make the you have to create the environment where that could actually happen and if you don't it won't um, and i think that's true whether you're trying to write a song or whether you're trying to start a podcast. I, I feel like there's so many people, for as many people who uh, <laughs> that started a podcast in the pandemic, <laughs> there's so many people who are like, I have an idea for a podcast. And that's as far as they get with it for months or and maybe it never gets anywhere from there. And what you need to do is be like, well, I have an idea and now I'm gonna actually see it through. Bring me the best word.